Miniature soldiers for child's play. It's actually been almost 20 years since they stopped mass producing them from metal. Today, large scale producers make such toys almost exclusively of plastic. But we were lucky to find a company that still uses the old process for producing the little men and makes them look just like those our fathers, grandfathers, and even great grandfathers used to play with. Interestingly, the toy soldier has hardly changed over time. This one dates back to the 1930s. And this one, recently. And what do we see? They are almost the same. These toy soldiers are made from metal. By the way, it's not your good old tin. The alloy is composed of other metals. Production of soldiers from pure tin stopped almost 100 years ago, mainly because it was an unhealthy process. But we will talk about metal later. In the meantime, let's look at the first step in producing toy soldiers for kids. What happens first? Everything begins with a sketch. The artist creates a draft for a future toy. It could be a single figure of a warrior or, like here, several people in motion. Then the picture will be cut out from paper. It will be used as the stencil. Thermoplastic is placed right over it. It is a pliable material, similar to clay, that solidifies when heated. The artist uses his tools to shape a three-dimensional figurine. While not fully 3D, it is convex but slightly compressed, flattened on two sides. This is done both for the sake of using less material and for strength but primarily because this is the easiest fabrication method. The future figurine will be used for child's play. There is no need to spend too much time on details. Besides, the toy must leave room for the child's imagination. While this is happening, the mold for the future soldier is being prepared. It'll be made of molded rubber, a soft and pliable material. The finished figurine hardens after thermal treatment is simply pressed into two rubber bases. The rubber is vulcanized, that is heated, and it solidifies too. We pull the plastic soldier out of the rubber base and we can see an impression where it has been. Next stage is casting. The rules for casting a metal soldier are the same as for casting any metal product. The producers may choose either a rubber mold or a gypsum molding flask. The material used is an alloy composed of tin, cast iron, and 10 to 15% of bismuth to improve yield. There are two options for casting. We can choose the conventional method or use a centrifuge. Okay, here's how it works. The device is called centrifuge. The mold is placed inside, pressed down tightly, and rotation starts. Metal is poured from the top through this hole here. We need the centrifuge to make sure that metal fills the impressions of soldiers inside the mold evenly, without any cavities. After cooling, the two halves of the rubber mold are taken apart, and that's what we have. Ah oh well, not a very neat picture, with streaks and burrs, but that is normal. Next, each soldier will be polished. By the way, the artist paints the figurines by hand. The artist first applies primer to improve adhesion of the paint. Then, she will paint the main elements, clothes, the face, and the arms. That's it, the toy soldier is ready for battle. The very last step 
is to pack it and ship it to the store. Metal toy soldiers are becoming a rarity. They are mostly made of plastic. But if we are talking about children's activities, such toys are certainly the most adorable. And they have what is known as ancestral memory. Because these are the kinds of toys our parents played with, just like many generations before them. Well, these were toy soldiers, soldiers for games. What's up next? Wartime miniatures, or military miniatures. What makes these figurines so special that they can cost thousands of euros? War game battles, all ages submit to these games. And we will talk about the vast variety of toy soldiers across the world and the materials that have been used to produce them. See all this on Experiments soon. The history of toy soldiers dates back several thousand years. Since then, the world has seen plenty of types and subtypes of these small objects, but a particular period in history is thought to be the official launch date of their mass production. This was when certain standards and sizes for this toy were first established. In the early days of toy soldier making, there was no thought of standardization. Toy soldiers were produced in different countries, came in all kinds of sizes, and were made from all kinds of materials. The standard was only developed in the middle of the 19th century. It happened when a certain Ernst Heinrichsen agreed on the following uniform size with other producers of tin figures. A dismount soldier would be 32 millimeters high, the height of a horse soldier would be 44 millimeters, not counting the headdress. Such soldiers became known as the Nuremberg soldiers. That was the starting point for mass production of the figures, and not much has changed. Here they are, the Nuremberg Boy Soldiers. In fact, they are still freely sold at auctions, and you can buy one at a very affordable price, like this one here. It was made at the end of the 18th century and is worth two euros. After the Nuremberg Agreements, Experiments with materials for soldiers continued. Tin and metal in general is by far not the only material that has been used to make toy soldiers. Like this one. This is a paper soldier, a cardboard base and a profile carved out of paper and painted on two sides. A very popular toy, by the way. First and foremost because of its price. What other materials were used for industrial production of toy soldiers? Let's ask the owner of this collection. The first toy soldiers were made of an alloy composed of tin and lead. Over time, processes became more sophisticated. Respectively, other materials emerged. And as soon as a new material was developed, someone tried using it for making toy soldiers. Cast iron, plastic, paper, clay, rubber, everything was used. Well, we have already seen paper soldiers, and here are some plastic ones, for example. Native Americans, lots of them, were produced in East Germany. Wood, these are mostly old toys that were made in villages. Cast iron, oddly enough, lots of cast iron toy soldiers were made in the United States. Indeed, that was a game only the strongest kids could play. And here are soldiers made from resin. These were made in the UK and France. The material used was epoxy resin. But despite all this variety, they have one thing in common. They belong to particular countries. Typically, each country mostly produced miniature replicas of soldiers serving in their own armies. After all, a toy soldier is not only a toy. In the Soviet Union, they promoted toy soldiers and Toys including military machines very actively. That's why the many commanders in chief dealt with this issue seriously and even wrote articles on the subject. As a result, soldiers were made of aluminum, wood, tin, some of its alloys known now. After World War II, metal was again used a lot, then plastic pushed it out. And after the collapse of the USSR, well, there were only small cooperatives left whose products we now can see again in the same collections. Next, 
Valentine miniatures. The price of these pieces can be as high as several thousand euros. Can we really call these tiny sculptures toy soldiers and war games? Why do adults play with toys? We have now seen the process of creating toy soldiers that will be used for children's games. But there is another vast area known as wartime miniatures. They are also known as military miniatures. Anyway, miniatures illustrate the idea that sometimes less is more. This holds very true. Less can be more and better. These figures are made with great attention to detail. They are very colorful, and their production is an extremely complex process. It would be more correct to call them miniature sculptures. Wartime miniatures are no toys. They are collected and carefully stored on shelves. There are only a few companies in Russia that make such beauty. It is possible to distinguish, say, the most popular time period. Well, the most sought-after pieces are those presenting the Middle Ages knights. They are bright, they have the fighting spirit, they have energy. This means they present, so to say, the most multidimensional interest for, well, for the collector. And an artist can make the most of his skills, and the sculptor can show off his talent. So what's the difference between the process to produce a collectible wartime miniature from that to make a toy soldier? Generally speaking, there's no difference. Historical miniatures are also first created in plastic. Then they are cast in metal and painted. But it's like comparing an expensive car and a cheap car. Small nuances and workmanship make all the difference. This is called the frame. Unlike game toy soldiers, historic miniatures are often presented in complex poses. The figures can be standing or seated or they can be shown in motion. And this metal skeleton has the function to strengthen the sculpture. The sculptor will gradually build the warrior's body around it. This is a real sculpture. Attention is given to each fold and wrinkle. The head will be sculpted separately. I mean, literally, it will be made on a special holder. The sculptor tries to create a realistic image. That is why, ultimately, the wartime miniature will look so true to life. The figure must have a personality. This is the greatest difficulty, to show personality. Then the miniature is taken apart. This is because the figures are shown in complex poses. It is impossible to cast them from metal as a single piece. That's why most often various elements, the arms, the legs, and the torso, are cast separately. Preparation of casting molds is a step worth special attention. Look at these wires here. They are called vents. Gases will accumulate inside the mode in the process of casting. If they cannot find a way out, the resulting figure may have tiny bubbles inside. The vents, just like an exhaust pipe in a car, withdraws hot gases so that the metal fills the mold very tightly. Now we need to make locks to make sure the parts of the mold do not shift relative to each other during the casting process. That's a very easy part. You take a stick and make small indentations in clay around the perimeter of your piece. Then rubber is poured over the plastic figurine. It takes the shape of the sculpture. Rubber is then placed in the gypsum molding flask for additional rigidity. The soldier is removed from the mold and we are now ready to pour the metal. After cooling, elements of the warrior will be taken out from the mold. They are polished, small roughness is removed, Next step is painting. Exactly the same way, 
as with toy soldiers. Wartime miniatures are painted in several stages. No expert will tell you their exact number, but essentially it comes down to a focus on detail. First, the artist applies a coat of primer, then the main color is applied. Next, each fold is chiseled. The artist even achieves the light and shade effect. The face is painted separately. The artist does not simply paint the facial features, he gives them a certain expression and may even create a lifelike portrait. After the figure is fitted on the pedestal, weathering is created, meaning elements of the landscape. I have no idea what weather has to do with this step in modeling, but this is how it is called. Pieces of grass, moss, even snow is replicated and added on the pedestal. This is a completed item. Detailed, realistic, and bright copies of warriors from different eras from ancient Babylonians to African warriors, from Romans to Germans, from pharaohs to emperors. One can look at them forever, peer at the small details, ornaments, and weapons. By the way, they have sharp swords and spears made of real steel, and they have real bowstrings on their bows. It is not surprising that such miniatures cost a lot of money and take long to complete. Each of them is a product of hard work. And just as a remark, miniatures by Russian artists often win first prizes at various international competitions. Watch in the final part. Grown-ups can play with soldiers too. What is a war game? What do its rules look like? And why are miniatures used in war games true to life? Watch on this episode of Toy Soldiers on Experiments. Toy soldiers are not only for children. These are tabletop strategy games, or rather, war games. This is their proper name, Games of War. The Indian Chaturanga is one of the oldest tabletop games and a prototype of modern chess. Unlike chess, the exact rules for Chaturanga are still unknown. Military exercises became yet another inspiration for war games. In the 19th century, military commanders wishing to cut costs increasingly used tabletop versions instead of real-life exercises. Soldiers and machines were replaced with figures. This mix of figures and rules was the starting point for all war games of today. There is a wide choice of games available. Some war games turn to real-life events, such as ship battles. There are also fantasy war games, or sci-fi war games. Warhammer is by far the most popular of them all. Such rooms become battlefields of game zones. People come here in the evening, after a working day, or just like now, on the weekend. Warhammer Fantasy is the older version. There is also Warhammer 40,000. The latter enjoys the greatest popularity today. What is the game about? It is about battles fought between the armies in a fictional universe. The players are required to buy their figurines unassembled. They glue them together and paint them by hand. You can do this on your own, or you can ask an artist to help you. Do you use such models for the game? It depends. What is also typical for this game is that there are large figures along with small ones. And let's say the army can consist of around 70 models. Uh -huh. Or it can consist of 150 models. 
It makes no sense to name all the armies. There are a lot of them, and new are added every few years. This is the secret of Warhammer and similar tabletop games in general. Do you think toy soldiers are the most important thing in a game? Not at all. Books like this are the central component here. A Galaxy of War. This is a guide on the miniature series. You can find all figures belonging to every army here. The Dark Millennium. This book describes the Warhammer universe. The rules that prescribe how the battle should be fought on the playing field. And the Codex. It contains a more detailed description of each army. This is the secret of Warhammer. It is not the figures that make it so exciting. It's the background. The elaborate fictional world that can be explored through books, comics, animated cartoons, and computer strategy games or shooters. Well then, today's battle will be between Tyranids and the Space Marines. Let the games begin. The game as such is an important but not the most crucial component of a war game. Yes, there are rules. You throw the dice, you measure the distance covered by the soldiers with a ruler, you read assignment cards, but winning in a particular battle is not the main purpose. The club is primarily an assembly of people excited about a common hobby where you can chat, discuss subtleties in painting, and of course, play in a comfortable setting. The club is a meeting place for people sharing the same hobby. Oddly enough, even though war games are a huge achievement in terms of marketing, everything somehow depends on the figurines. Those who come here have been thrilled by games with toy soldiers since they were children. The only difference is that with age, the rules have become more sophisticated and the armies have a greater structure and functionality. But except for this, it doesn't seem to be very different from, say, children's room. Even though the world of toy soldiers looks like something that is not serious, this is an industry that works both for children and grown-ups. Toy soldiers, wartime miniatures, and war games alike can carry away both the youngest children and those who have children of their own. It is all too easy to dismiss the hobbyists saying they have not played enough as children, but this does not hold true for the world of miniatures, because you can say this about any hobby. I'd rather suggest there is something appealing about them specifically for boys and men. This is exactly what makes us excited about war movies and ultimately associate ourselves with a warrior ready to fight for a good cause.